So if you could press that button and bring CO2 back to what it was 100 or 200 years ago, and it would cost very little, and it would be proven safe, would you press that button to restore the CO2? Yeah, everyone I've ever talked to, every nods. And the cost is, when we calculate it out, about a billion dollars a year. If each of the one percenters in our country put in a dollar a day, that would pay to restore CO2 back using nature's method. And so you're probably asking, well, wait a minute, why aren't we doing it? Welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina, and I'll be your host as we discuss Climate Restoration Roadmap 2024. And to aid in this discussion, we have a guest none other than Mr. Peter Fikowski. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, Peter is an American author, he's a physicist, and he is founder of the field of climate restoration. And he's written a book, The Only Future That Will Sustain the Human Race. That's one of a few books that he has penned. And we're very, very excited to have him here with us today. As you know, that we tend to focus on the very real issues that mainstream media leaves out regarding climate change and the damage that has been done to our planet due to the burning of fossil fuels. And so, of course, that can get a little difficult at times to hear the things that humanity has wrought to our beautiful living planet. But today we have someone who will offer a glimmer of hope and what can be done to ameliorate the damage and to bring about a more prosperous, healthy, equitable planet Earth. So I know that I'm very excited, and I hope that you will be too. Let's just go ahead and start. Peter, please tell us what you have to share with us today about the state of climate restoration. Great. Regina, thank you. And everyone who's listening, thank you for your interest. I'm going to start with a little exercise, a little story. And so in this exercise, imagine that there's a button in front of you that you can press, a button that you can press. And when you press it, the CO2 in our atmosphere goes back to what it was 100 years ago. So if you could press that button and bring CO2 back to what it was 100 or 200 years ago, and it would cost very little, and it would be proven safe, would you press that button to restore the CO2? Yeah, everyone I've ever talked to, every nods. Like, I assume it's not a trick question, and it's not a trick question. And... I think you know that our planet has been through ice ages and we know how the ice ages work and we actually could restore the climate. We could restore CO2 the same way nature has if we wanted to. And the cost is when we calculate it out about a billion dollars a year. What that equates to is if you're an American like me, if all each of the one percenters in our country put in a dollar a day that would pay to restore CO2 back using nature's method. And so you're probably asking, well, wait a minute, why aren't we doing it? If we could restore the climate, why aren't we doing it? And I've got two, two answers for you. The first one is another uh, little bit of an exercise. And that is, how many of you are tentative believers in there are no silver bullets? Yeah, so pretty much all of us believe there are no silver bullets. Now, the fact of the matter is, to my knowledge, no one has come back to, to us from the future and reported that, in fact, there were no silver bullets. You know, that's a conjecture. It's a little bit like, you know, in our society, people believe that if I behave well, I'll go to heaven. And to my knowledge, no one's come back from heaven and said, hey, it's true. If you behave well, you go to heaven. It's a conjecture. And so for the rest of this little talk, I ask that you 
set it aside as a conjecture that we don't know if it's going to be a silver bullet or two silver bullets or 10,000 silver bullets. We don't know. So, which is very radical that we just simply not knowing. So that, that's the first answer is that we've constrained our thinking to eliminate anything that might be a silver bullet, just for almost religious reasons. Then the other reason that we haven't pursued it, and I'll go into what it is and how we get there, the actual roadmap. But once we push the button, you know, the, the thing that's been stopping us from pushing the button has been, you know, in the 1980s, climate got to be very serious and there were me increasing meetings and discussions. And it was very clear in the 1980s, especially the early 80s, that if we just stop emitting CO2, we would preserve a healthy climate, right? In the 1980s, you could not see global warming against natural variations in CO2 and warming. And so it was invisible. And so the assumption was eliminate emissions, stop allowing humans to impact the climate system. Well, that was made a lot of sense up until 1988. Now, you probably know 1988 is when CO2 went above 350 parts per million. And if we had been awake, we would have said, okay, new game. We lost that game. <laughs> we now need to restore the climate. Alas, there was no one in the judge's box to declare a game over. But the game we're still playing was ended in 1988. The new game is restoring. Really, the, the very bottom line is this now. This is very good news I'm going to give. And that is last week, MIT announced their new climate project. And in addition to the usual decarbonization of industry and travel, they're also targeting restoring the atmosphere. And so now MIT has stood in the judge's box, which they're authorized to do, the president of MIT, and said, restoring the atmosphere is a valid thing to do. And that means... All of us who have wanted to restore CO2 levels and methane levels, we do not need to worry about being accused of being geoengineers anymore because it's been validated as a valid thing to do rather than it's that's modifying the climate. This slipped right by me until a week ago. Uh, the Bezos Earth Fund also is starting, starting last month, is starting in January of 24, started targeting restoring pre-industrial greenhouse gas levels. And so we now have a funder validating that it's okay to restore the climate and the university validating that it's okay to restore the climate. In California, we passed a law in uh, last July of 2023, also saying that it, California is committing to restoring a safe climate for future generations with CO2 near pre-industrial. So, the judges are just about complete changing over. One of the things to do is encourage people to realize that climate restoration, not only is it possible, but it's now becoming allowable. So how do we restore the climate? What's the roadmap? And there's uh, four parts to it. It's only the last part. The last part is the one that, you, that you're expecting me to talk about, but I'll leave that to the very end. The first part of the roadmap is it, there has to be governance. There has to be some organization that is guiding the act, people taking action to take concerted action, make sure it's safe, make sure it's effective, and most important, make sure that it includes all the relevant parties. Because if you leave any party out, you know, let's say it's scientists, let's say it's First Nations, if they're not part of the planning, they're going to as human, human nature does, assume that you're out to get them. And so it's, you've got, so that's the governance. So that's critical. We've established the Climate Restoration Safety and Governments, Governance Board, crsgb.org. It's small, it has no funding yet. And I think it, the funding will come this year, but it's got, it's got the necessary plan. So that's the first avenue. The second one is funding. Intuitively, we think that the government is going to fund re restoring the climate, it's going to fund climate work. But in fact, in business, we know that you have to address the needs of your customers. And the customer for climate restoration is our grandchildren. 
you know, and our children and our great, great, great grandchildren. But the point is that our grandchildren, they don't pay taxes, they don't vote, they don't uh, lobby. And so there's really no reason for the government to invest money in our great, great grandchildren. It's much more important to win elections, win wars, send people to the moon and stuff like that. I'm sorry, that's reality. It is the way it is. And yes, some some countries might put money into restoration for a while, but then the other party will come in and they'll take the money away, almost certainly. Corporations. Well, you know, corporations are there to earn money for their investors. And the investors want to retire. And that's why they invest in the company. If a company says, oh, we're investing in your great-grandchildren, then the uh, uh, executives are going to say, oh, we can't do that. We have to invest right now because our investors want to retire soon. So uh, we created the Grandparents Fund, or I'm now calling it the Grandparents Legacy Fund for restoring the climate. And it's called the Biden Project. And that is, we need the political will. And as I mentioned a minute ago, MIT having it within the week announced it and Bezos, I'm pushing hard to get uh, Department of Energy to push President Biden to announce that the U.S. is committed to restoring a safe climate, a safe atmosphere for our children. And that will, as everything I have seen, that will solidly land it, that it's okay to restore the climate and we're not going to be called geoengineers anymore. The last one is how do you actually do it? And so the way nature has restored the climate is ocean fertilization. I think pretty much everyone listening to this is familiar with that. We've mapped it out. You can see it in the paper. It's going to cost probably a hundred million, but I call it a billion dollars a year. And then for methane oxidation, we have to deal with the methane. And that's also about the same. And so all of those projects are now instituted and beginning here in 2024. And by 2030, we should have the methane oxidation fully in operation. Uh, you know, we've checked to make sure it's safe and it needs to be continuously checked, but it's what nature does. So the risk of it is very low since it's been in practice for millions of years. And the same with the ocean fertilization. And so I, you know, I invite people to get involved in any way you want, be it from the science, the technology, and the investment, and so on. I really like the idea of of getting rid of that term geoengineering. I think it sparks fear in a lot of people's minds. Um, so I think that's that's a really good point to bring up. One of the thing that you mentioned that I'm a, I'm a little curious about. So you had mentioned that these programs would be funded by the top one percent of Americans, and I'm wondering why not from maybe Europe, Australia, uh, and why is it that um, you suggest that it is uh, wise for the fossil industries, fossil fuel industry, not to pay into any of these programs? Mm. Well, uh, I only discuss the the American one percenters because I live in America and I can identify with them from time to time. I've actually been there at the moment, unfortunately not, but hopefully again. And uh, But yeah, everywhere, I think people will do it. I expect that it, uh, almost everyone would want to chip in. I, I looked at it, the demographics that, you know, my children are in their 30s and they love climate restoration, but man, they're busy with my three grandkids and their careers and their houses. My friends, you know, who are like me, um, like we have the time, we have the money, we have nothing better to do, period. So that, that yeah, it, it goes everywhere. But I, I like the math of the one percenters. You realize, oh my God, this is easy. And then as far as companies getting involved, well, companies will get involved. We know Microsoft is involved. But then, you know, again, as an entrepreneur, I asked, why is Microsoft involved? And how do they justify it to their shareholders? And the answer is, it's really good marketing. If you were up against Apple, Microsoft work on, on carbon removal makes them look like a good uh, world citizen. Now, at some point, that marketing thing is going to change. And then they're, they'll, they'll be obligated to stop investing the money. So they should keep doing it while they can. But because our grandchildren are really important to us, we want to 
stake the fun, the main funding on us grandparents. I love seeing all the, the gray hairs on this call. Thank you for that, Peter. So Peter, I know you have thoughts on this issue and I'm wondering what thoughts you have on what Peter Fakowski just shared with us. Yeah, I I like what Peter's doing. I have to say that the worse the condition the planet is in and the more people are sort of doing nothing, the more I like Peter's idea and Peter's project. I really think that really the whole world needs to get into their consciousness um, the idea of uh, climate restoration as as the emergency response. I should acknowledge that in 1988, um, James Hansen did his famous um, presentation of Congress um, in which he said he was 99% certain that global warming was already operating. And, you know, it's quite amazing. And when you read read over James Hansen's paper, he, he sort of projected everything on the extreme weather events and the whole thing. So now, of course, what's happening is that uh, our governments have done nothing. They've done worse than nothing. They're still subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. Uh, rereading over, over Peter's work, I get the impression, that actually, that... Um, uh, he, he he is very much a realist. I think he, he is aware, or it's certainly inferred, that he doesn't expect governments to do a damn thing, right? So uh, I like the term a lot. I think it needs to re replace all of those terms, as, as you were saying, Peter. I like the um, the concepts and the plans that you have in place. I like those a lot because we have no plan out there there's no plan out there. If somebody goes to the uh, internet and tries to find a plan for climate change, they're not going to find one, right? So you're doing a very, very great thing, in my opinion, because you have a plan, right? Okay. You are acknowledging that we're in a terrible situation and you have a plan to do something about it, right? So that's uh, got to be good. Now, uh, tragically, it's got to be good because 50% of our young people, apparently, um, uh, the Lancet poll, it was terrible to read, but I guess it's logical. They don't think they have a future, right? So climate restoration and the whole concept, like I say, the consciousness and the way of thinking, yeah, that's great. That's really, really what we need. Interesting, actually, one of the things I'm, I'm keeping on trying to, um, well, there are two things like I'm constantly repeating. One is that the IPC says, that uh, global emissions have to be declining now. And the other thing, of course, is stopping fossil fuel subsidies. I, I don't think you have fossil fuel subsidies in the plan, but I guess you're sort of a realist and you realize, well, no, just not bloody well going to happen because the government's going to continue to do it. Oh, I did notice you have um, a graph with uh, emissions and then uh, taking down the emissions, removing the emissions, so to speak, so I was quite happy to see, actually, you have emissions declining on an immediate basis in that graph. So that, that's really good. Uh, and I think it was very clever, you know, putting out over it, over the top of it, progressive, uh, uh, rapidly increasing removal of CO2. So in my one book um, of 2018, I, I realized that we had to have a, a huge, huge project. And um, we certainly need it now. And I call that a Manhattan project for the climate. But what we have to do is throw all of our resources, right? All of our resources, financial, technological, scientific, and human resources on restoring the climate. Hmm? That's really the only future that we have, right? We do not have another future. Um, atmospheric CO2 is at least 422 parts per million. So now it's just over a 50% increase on pre-industrial. I, I think Peter mentioned that it's, a, it, it's at a 14 million year high, 14 million on, on a paper that just came out last month. And I won't say how fast it's, it's increasing because it's, it's uh, just mind boggling. But it is increasing faster now than it ever have before. It's been accelerating right from 1958, you know, when Charles Keeling set up his uh, great apparatus. 
And it's also accelerating right now as we speak over the past few months, increasing faster than ever. So my final comment is we have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and we have to be doing it now, right? And um, uh, the iron, okay, don't call it fertilization. Anyway, the, the iron oh, thing, you know, we, we, have, we have a lot of oil, ocean, which is iron deficient, right? Yeah, um, I would be all for throwing a lot of iron in the ocean as soon as we possibly damn well can, right? We got to do something, people. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. I just have a quick question before we move on to Paul. How have we determined that the oceans are iron deficient, Peter Bukowski? Uh, I don't know how they've measured it, but you can find maps of the ocean. And uh, the minimum iron needed is about 100 parts per trillion or a tenth of a part per billion. And most of the ocean is about one thirtieth of that. So less than two or three parts per trillion. And I don't know how they measure it. I see. So we're talking about like a vitamin for the oceans, if you will. Yes. Yeah. It comes out uh, per square meter um, per year to get the, the ocean bright green is about um, a milligram of iron per year. So that if you, that's like a, a hundredth of a teaspoon of, of iron chloride, of iron sulfate. Thank you for explaining that. Um, and Paul, I, I know that you're very interested in this topic as well. Yes, uh, thanks everybody. And uh, Peter, it's wonderful to have you on, on the Climate Emergency Forum. Um, it really reminds me of some of the great times uh, we've had at the, uh, at the COPs. So I love the idea of the Grandparents Legacy Fund, and it really follows along the lines of what Bill McGibbon said. He visited um, Ottawa a few weeks ago, and uh, he gave some very interesting stats on the U.S. He said that there's 70 million people over 60 years old in the U.S. right now, and he said that 10,000 people are joining that cohort every day. Okay, so this is a lot of people, and these are this is people that have had careers. Many of them are retired. You know, a lot of them are leaving money to their kids and stuff. And you know, they might want to consider funds like what you're talking about, so that the kids that they're leaving money to end up having a future for their themselves and their kids. So, Bill also talked about some of the nonviolent uh, actions that he's been involved in such as the what he called the Rocking Chair Rebellion. Mm -hmm. I love that name. And he's involved in a group called thirdact.org. The idea that this is the third act or, or basically, you know, the first act for people in their lives. You know, if you look at people's life cycles, you know, the first act would be their youth and then middle age. And, you know, now they're in their later years, the third act. So he's actually trying to really push organization of older people on the climate issues. So all of this fits in perfectly with what you were talking about. I love your beginning when you were talking about the F button. We've been pushing the, the wrong F buttons, you know, on all aspects. So we need to push the Fiakowski F button, you know, not the other, the other F buttons. I'm talking about the wars and the, the lack of action by governments and so on. So, and, I also like your uh, commentary about silver bullets. I mean, I always thought, you know, silver bullets were to kill the vampire, right? So, <laughs> you know, it, it is a conjecture and maybe we should be reframing it. Maybe we need to call the climate restoration um, gold bullets, okay? So there can be no silver bullets that's ingrained in people's minds, but there are gold bullets or platinum bullets with climate restoration. So. You know, I love playing around with these names. We interviewed a very interesting author who was talking about climate vocabulary for the future. So, you know, I, I, I love trying to think of things like weather weirding and, and uh, blue ocean events and things like that. Because I think, you know, I think they stick in people's mind. The vocabulary is important to address the problems. You know, it's very exciting, your mention of, uh, you know, MIT's work. 
there's also so the work with uh, California government. You know, California has always been progressive in fighting climate change and getting renewable energy, getting electric cars and things like that. And the population of California exceeds that of many, many countries. So it has a, you know, a, a really high influence. And Bezos Earth Fund, that's fantastic that people are considering it. And, uh, you know, I know that Catherine Hayhoe, great climate scientist, Canadian, attended the uh, Davos conference. And I think she was involved in about 20 sessions. And many of those were pushing the, you know, the idea to some of the world's wealthiest people as to the gravity of, of the climate situation and things that we can do about it. So anyway, it's great. It's great having you on your show. And thank you for all, all of your work. You know, it's interesting, uh, Peter, when you talked about um, the 1% helping to fund this, and we know that the wealthiest demographic in every country, but especially the wealthiest Americans, contribute the greatest amount to greenhouse gas emissions, to climate degradation. And it's really, really difficult. Dr. Peter Carter spoke about needing a, a Manhattan project, in essence, to cure the ailing planet. And I agree so much, but there's such a challenge as well. For example, when we look at America, 400 of the wealthiest Americans own as much wealth as 150 million of the bottom Americans, which I guess would include me as well. So when you have 400 people who have gobbled up all the wealth of half an entire nation, it's really, really difficult to uh, to corral those people to do what's right to do. And I'm, I'm just wondering how is some of the greatest projects that we've come up, at least in this country, have involved our entire nation and all of the people when people were taxed in a more equitable way before the 400 wealthiest Americans changed tax code and tax law. I'm just wondering, it seems like there is so much involved in this. How do you see this happening? How do we create this Manhattan project that is so necessary, this moonshot? Let's call it the earth shot. Right. Well, Gina, that is the best question. Um, and I, I use neuroscience here. And it turns out that what causes our behavior is our expectation for the future. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm expecting to have breakfast. And it doesn't matter whether it's raining or snowing, I had a good night or a bad night, somehow my body goes there and whether we're out of eggs or out of oatmeal, breakfast happens because I my brain is expecting it. And the same way uh, having us expect uh, the, the climate restored, having us saying, you know what, we are restoring the climate, that will move people in that direction convincing people doesn't work. If you have kids, you know what I mean. You can argue them to your blue in the face and they'll do what they do. And so getting the, the one percenters to do it, it's a matter of the kind of work that you're doing on this uh, podcast, which is create talking to people and they get excited about this future. I call it the future of uh, humanity flourishing for millennia to come. Now I'm I'm a scientist, so I know that you know humans have been around for three million years. So I actually say hu humanity flourishing for another million years, but for most people that's impossible to think about. But imagine that, like, why wouldn't we want to keep our planet habitable by humans for at least another million or ten million years? Like we could do that. We just raise the temperature ten times faster than nature ever has, and we actually know how to reduce it. You know, uh, I have an article out on my website uh, called the Pinatubo Pause, and it shows that after Mount Pinatubo erupted in 91, we had net zero for a year. So just randomly, this volcano dumped enough. Now, there was the cooling that we all know about. So that's separate. That was sulfates in the stratosphere. Separate from that, there was the dust that had iron in it that fell into the South China Sea. There happened to be a downwelling eddy there. And so the phytoplankton and all the life that happened got drained down into the deep ocean and that 20 gigatons of CO2 were never seen again. 
Uh, they will be eventually. They will circulate over the thousand year uh, ocean circulation. But the point is, keep talking about restoring the climate, giving our, our commitment to giving our children a, a safe climate. And that will direct our actions, just the, that story. Peter F. has just repeated um, uh, what I think is the very best thing uh, about his project, this project. And that is a vision for the future, right? I mean, I thought and realized for many years that we can achieve the best of all possible futures, right? We get our fossil fuels, right? We switch to uh, renewable energy, which we've known we can do for many decades. And there isn't another future after all, right? So putting out this uh, this vision, you know, for a future which is more than habitable, you know, more than livable, but if, uh, but a future on a planet so, which is a joy, right, and uh, blissful experiences to live on, right, which we've had up up to now. So I think that's great. There's, there's a couple of things that I I just want to. Uh, mentioned which were really important that regina mentioned and the first one is the uh, is the terrible terrible inequity which is worse than in inequity it's 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 a crime against all humanity basically so uh, um the last thing i read is that we have 10 percent, the top 10 percent of the world responsible for 50 percent of the emissions so, Peter, when you were talking about the 1%, um, of course, what came to my mind is, uh, yeah, yeah, make them pay, right? But make that 10% pay. Now, the other thing that Regina uh, mentioned, of course, was um, uh, was the tax system, right? So, as she referred to, we, we've developed this system which rewards people the most who do the most harm to the planet and the future. So that has to be changed. And that can be done at a stroke of the pen, for heaven's sake. You know, you change the tax system, right? Tax carbon, although I don't like the term carbon tax. I think it's a pollution charge. That first of all, the corporations should have to pay uh, primarily and secondarily the, the citizens. So, yeah, thanks very much. Great discussion. I'm enjoying this. Yeah, the, Peter, um, actually, I hadn't thought of it until you just said it, but the as i said the total cost of removing the co2 and the methane is around a billion dollars a year now it could be wrong it could be 10 billion but that's still essentially zero so uh, 1 billion dollars a year is 1 100,000th of the world economy and so when we talk about taxing the one percenters really we're talking a dollar a day that's not even a tax <laughs> that's just sweeping up the the dust and so the, the point is, it can be very easy. And I like, and I'll be adopting what you said, that changing the tax structure will make a big difference. And it, it didn't occur to me. I used to work hard on carbon taxes back when uh, you know, wind and solar was more expensive than natural gas and coal. But you know, the, the carbon fee or the pollution fee could easily pay for restoring the climate. And uh, it might. That is to say, uh, people might not complain about that. Oh, by the way, Peter, I got something that you'll like. When I when I was uh, sort of um, uh, re-rehearsing, I, I found the Rand Corporation, no less, you're nodding your head, so you're probably aware, like the idea of climate restoration and have actually looked into some of the methods that you're promoting. So if you've got Rand behind you, you should be able to do pretty well. I think so. I think so. Yeah, th that was the very, very, very first article ever about re climate restoration. I, I just first I want to emphasize that we don't have the luxury of time. You know, as many people that have watched this channel and others are starting to realize, you know, if people if you follow James Hansen's work and, you know, what's happened with the temperature rate of temperature rise, you know, increasing from 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade up to about 2010 and increasing above that now by 50 to 100 percent, you know, and also his climate sensitivity numbers are 4.8 degrees Celsius for a doubling of CO2. And there's error of 1.2 on that. So it could be as high as six degrees. The last three months running average has crossed 1.7, you know, 2023 crossed 1.5. So things are really spiking up 
quickly. So we need to always keep the urgency. If we leave it and if we if we don't act immediately on all of these things as quickly as possible, then it's going to be much harder to do it going forward. So there is a question about the financing of projects. So, for example, ocean pasture restoration or plankton, you know, iron, modifying the chemistry slightly of the ocean so, it, so that the phytoplankton proliferate and absorb huge amounts of carbon, things like that are very important if we can do them. And unfortunately, the ocean sinks. What's the carbon being captured in the oceans take taken a big drop, you know, in the last number of years, which is another reason why CO2 levels are spiking up so quickly. So the problem is, is there are some methods that seem to be very cheap, as you're pointing out, but there's also a lot of people in carbon markets that are looking to make money with their schemes of carbon removal. So, you know, they might be against your your very cheap methods, which are good for the planet, good for us, but not good for some individuals making making money in their in their in their new companies, startups. So, uh, how how do we address that? I guess. Well, uh, I thought about it, and at the moment, the uh, the approach I'm taking is create two areas for ocean fertilization. So I just call it ocean iron fertilization. People say, what should we call it? Well, the only people who really oppose it are the scientists. You know, I've looked around and the the standard suspects, you know, uh, Greenpeace or the uh, ETC group, they don't have a problem with restoring the climate. They just have a, a problem with false climate solutions, which we are alluding to with regards to the carbon offsets. Now, there's a lot of money. You know, uh, the news reports claim that it's going to be a ten uh, a ten trillion dollar market. No, one point two trillion dollar market by 2050. I think that's nonsense, but nonsense doesn't matter. That's what the Bloomberg is reporting. That makes it real. And so, there's a lot of money in that. We're not going to fight that money. Right. We cannot fight that money. And so I'm supporting the idea that the people working on carbon offsets will do carbon offsets and they'll remove a few billion tons of CO2. And then those of us working on climate restoration will do the pinatubo replication. You know, so we actually do the stuff that nature does. And maybe we just make sure that you can't you can't get it certified for carbon offsets. So now they can have their carbon offset market, which makes them a lot of money and has nothing to do with restoring the climate, which it never has, right? The carbon offsets have always been about extending fossil fuels to reduce the cost of eliminating it. And so let them do that. What, are we going to stop them? I don't think so. Or some might, but not, not us. We have better things to do. And then in, a, in parallel, do the, the Pinatubo replication, actually do figure out how nature did it. And if nature did it, you know, uh, remove 20 gigatons in one year with no engineers, no planning, no spreadsheets, no computers, no ships, it just threw some dust in the air. It happened to land in a really good place. I'll bet we could do several times that in one spot. I don't know. I My point is, who knows? But it's far more likely we'll be able to exceed Pinatubo than not be able to match it. Anyway, but but to allow the two separate games, so like basketball and uh, U.S. American football, there's nothing in oppositional. They, they should operate in parallel. Yeah, I, I like uh, um, uh, Bucky Fuller said, you don't change things by opposing what's happening. You change reality by building an alternative. Uh, that's uh, that replaces uh, the current reality. Right. So so let's not talk about silver bullets. Let's talk about golden bullets for climate mm -hmm. restoration. Also, I think you mentioned that you're looking at some regions of the world where, you know, ocean fertilization would ocean restoration would be would would, would work well because of the the, you know, maybe lots of nutrients in the ocean just lacking iron, but also there could be even territorial waters of countries that, that want to try and set up these pilot projects. And then, you know, we can monitor the results through, you know, the Argo floats in the ocean, through ship surveys, through satellite monitoring, and demonstrate to the world 
this is a method that works extremely well and then expand it. Like you don't do all or nothing. You know, yeah. you start with projects. So I think that's a great approach to address some of these issues of, of institutes that say, you know, this isn't going to work or this is, is, isn't the right way approach. So. Yeah, the the, uh, the measurement of CO two. I I'm developing a technique, or I have a, a grad student at Stanford looking at the satellite data from the orbiting carbon observatory. And if you just look at the the as the winds blow across a place where uh, CO two is being removed, you know, where you're having a downwelling eddy with uh, phytoplankton growing, then um, you can actually see the CO two being removed. Now, the trouble with the satellite is that it, if it's cloudy, it can't measure anything. And so the, the, the data is spotty. And so in practice, we're expecting to use uh, buoys or floats that will just measure atmospheric CO2. Those can be expensive, but uh, there's a, a sort that I'm looking at, which is $6,000 $6, each. And they said, you know what? It's so cheap to try to retrieve it. It's actually going to cost more than $6,000. Is it the ocean acidification that's using up the iron? I'm not sure on the mechanisms. The, the it, It's like this, Paul. The, there are several factors. Uh, the first one, of course, is that iron simply doesn't dissolve well in water. It tends to sink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the half-life is, but it's on the order of a, a month or two or three before it's it sinks. And so it gets recycled and recycled. Much of the recycling was being done by whales. And then um, we killed off the whales. Now we think that we killed off the whales, you know, back in Moby Dick era. era. But mm -hmm. in fact, most of the whale killings just—it's horrible of us humans. But uh, it was done in the fifties and the sixties when we yeah. had the mechanized ships, and they could just mm -hmm. go through the whales like meat, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, uh, and replenishing, replenishing the whales is going to be a big deal because the whales dive deep and then they come up and they poop near the surface, so they bring. Right the iron and other nutrients back. So, uh, so maybe uh, one of the focuses should be on um, that you could, you know, add to your great report, by the way, is, uh, you know, restoration of, of biodiversity in the ocean, including, including whales, like say it directly. Most people are aware that like 90% of the large uh, marine uh, animals are not in the oceans anymore. You know, and many, many species of fish are on extinction lists and their numbers are greatly reduced. And people understand that. I mean, people in Canada experienced the collapse of the cod fishery and it's never really recovered. The, the, uh, the great concept of climate restoration does depend on the functioning carbon sinks, right? So um, in order for climate restoration to work, we, we, we do have to protect our forests and we'd have to stop cutting them down and burning them up. Um, but um, the ocean carbon sink is is declining. I, I mean, I was completely, absolutely shocked. Um, Global Carbon Project has been reporting this uh, reduction in the land and ocean carbon sink for the past three years. And every year it, it's higher. Um, uh, but as usual, I think with our scientists, they're not interested in getting that out there, you know? Yeah, they're, I mean... Not, um, so we have to, my final point is that uh, fish are part of the ocean carbon sink, for heaven's sake, right? So uh, we cannot continue um, this industrial fishing, which is absolutely unbelievable. The size of these fishing fleets, it's just incredible. Well, one so, of the things that will emphasize on the Pinatubo replication is how to maximize the benefit to the fisheries. Uh, yeah. That's not been studied yet. And uh, in fact, in the, science, the, the lore of science, they say, well, we don't even think that uh, iron fertilization uh, improves fisheries. I don't, right. don't understand the logic there, other than that no one's yeah. done a study, and sometimes lack of evidence is evidence of lack. But yeah. we are looking for uh, some fishery experts who will work with us in the Pinatubo replication. And we're hoping to get that started uh, within a year. The Global Carbon Project, uh, they've come out with a paper every, so there was a paper out just the end of last year, Global Carbon Budget 2023. Yeah, they do one, and it's usually in and, December every year. 
it has a lot of good information on on the carbon capture in the in the, the sinks in the ocean and the effects around that. If you haven't, you know, had a look at that paper, um, just Google the type Google Global Carbon Project paper. So they've been writing this paper since 2018, updating it every year. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I have to say it's a very nice departure and it's really, really wonderful to hear some bright ideas and some solutions. And the way I look at it is we need all kinds of thinking to occur. We need all kinds of ideas. I don't think we should nix them and to just put it all out on the table. And this sounds really, really good, Peter. And I'm so happy that you shared your knowledge with us today. And I I hope that uh, our regular viewers also enjoyed this show and that it provided them with some inspiration and a bit of energy to like, we need that energy, right? We need that inspiration. We need that to, to really propel us towards positivity. And that's what we need. It's just like uh, Dr. Peter Carter was saying, this internalized sense, this idea that we have to do something that comes from within and it motivates us. It's motivating. So I'm feeling really motivated and I want to thank you for that. And I hope that those of you who are watching also feel motivated. And I want you to be so motivated that you like, share, and subscribe, okay? Because that really helps us with the algorithm and we want you to stay in touch with us. By the way, for those of you who like the idea of putting all ideas out on the table, brainstorming in this Manhattan project, if you will, put those ideas down there and share them with us and let us all kind of brainstorm together. Just get that momentum going. So I wanna thank you all for spending the time with us on once again, another climate emergency form, and we'll see you next time.